Okay, so welcome, Carl. Uh, it's lovely to have you here today. You. Just to let you know, this session is being recorded and um, will be available after the session on uh, my hub on the my Beckett uh, booking site. Uh, the reason we've asked you to come along today, Carl, is because, first of all, you've got a very interesting career story to tell us. Mm. Um, this, the theme of today, Beyond Beckett, is clarity, career clarity. And you subtitle your session, Clarity Out of Chaos. Um, interesting, when I was chatting to you before, your message about careers can be quite messy. Yeah. But it just doesn't mean to say that um, it's not valuable and it's important to keep your end goal in sight. So, Carl, your story is an example of how careers are often not linear. There are stops and starts along the way and uh, the value of learning from experiences and taking opportunities as they arise. So if you have any questions, uh, please join them in the, put them in the chat function and we can go to them at the end. Otherwise, Carl, I will hand it over to you to tell us your story. Okay. Um, well, really, I suppose the story is that um, I had an idea of what I wanted to do fairly early on in um, before I went to university. Um, and then it changed and it changed again and it changed again. And the reason it carried on changing was because um, life happens and circumstances change and things don't necessarily unfold in a in a perfect and linear way. Um, and I think these days, one of the things that um, we possibly do a disservice to students with is we uh, sometimes give a narrative that there's a process. Mm -hmm. um, and that process is uh, you make decisions while you're in college about what you might want to do in the future. You make decisions about what you want to do next based on, on that. Um, you go through a, a period of further study of higher education and then we start talking to students about um, applying for graduate jobs mm -hmm. towards the end of that period and we support students in doing that and there are expectations I think that are built up by that. Um, now I've been I've been working at Leeds Beckett University in my role as a course director now for nearly 10 years. I think it's 10 years. Um, and I see over and over again that my story, the, 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 the wobbly kind of non-linear journey that I went through is reflected again and again in student stories. Mm -hmm. um, you quite a lot of students will expect to to go through that process of coming from college through to university and then straight into um, a, a graduate job and start applying for those graduate jobs yeah and I stay in touch with students and they'll come back to me and some sometimes they'll be frustrated about where they are six months or a year or two years after they've left uh, university I can tell you a story about a specific student um, before I get onto my own story, yeah. a really uh, first grade student that we had who graduated with the first um, from our degree, and I, it, was, it was in one of the first years I taught on BA journalism. Um, and I know that when he left, uh, he found it very difficult to actually find the job that he wanted to. He was very focused on wanting to get a job in print journalism. He had a, a pretty small job on a, on a local um community newspaper that catered for a small community uh, and lost that job and then was without work for quite a long time and i was in touch with him on social media and i would see frustrated posts from him about all the time that he'd spent um studying on his degree and the time he'd spent uh, at college and i spoke to him and other colleagues spoke to him during that time because we kept in touch and we appraised him of opportunities as they arose and we tried to encourage him to carry on uh, applying for things. 
and I don't want to tell you where he ended up working because I want to maintain anonymity because I've you know talked about the fact that he was quite frustrated about that process. But yeah. he now works for a national newspaper. And that didn't happen for him until a good uh, five years after he graduated. He managed to get a, a trainee position. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of graduate careers look like that mm-hmm. rather than look like the ideal. Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because if there are some career sectors, particularly creative sectors, like, for example, in the film yes. industry, yeah. the, the idea of a graduate route, it just doesn't exist. You know, students yeah. might go in as a runner, probably the same in, in journalism, um, where if, if you want to go into becoming an accountant or going to retail management, you know that kind of path is fairly um, straightforward there'll yes. be a graduate program graduate scheme so I yeah. do understand what you're saying Carl yeah yeah uh, so that that's a, that's very much the case Fran so in the creative industries um, and I think part of it is that uh, students exist within communities where they're talking to students that are on different kinds of program and have got different career aspirations but I still think I, th- I think some students might assume that all careers progress in the same way so that a, a career um, going into television might mirror a career going into retail or or accountancy, and it mm-hmm. absolutely doesn't. Mm. And what has happened over the years is that be, with the expansion of the higher education sector, um, in particular, a degree has become the entry level qualification, mm-hmm. and so students going into the creative industries will still be applying for and getting jobs that they may not see as graduate jobs. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to work in television or film, those jobs might be things like researcher jobs or runners, Mm -hmm. where a runner is literally an assistant on a set, Mm -hmm. um, going and fetching coffee and carrying memos around and maybe going and getting someone's dry cleaning done for them. And those are not things that you need a degree to do, mm-hmm. but you need a degree to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is not just reflective of contemporary times. That's really a hangover, if anything, from the way things used to be and the way things always have been in creative industries. And there's a sense in the creative industries that you've got to kind of earn your way into a position or a job by proving that you can do that that job um and we see that as well with a lot of our students that go into work experience uh, the the students that get the most out of work experience in art in the creative industries are the ones that um go in observe what is happening and then put themselves forward and start to offer ideas and uh, are in, engage with meetings and we get some students that will come back from a work experience um placement and they'll say nothing happened. I, I didn't do anything. And I just ended up sitting in a corner. They put me in front of a computer and left me there. <laughs> and what they were actually probably anticipating that that person would do would be come up with some stories and some ideas and, and present them at the meeting that everybody was having in the morning after realising that they'd need to do that after a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, I think people who get the most out of those sorts of experiences are those that put themselves forward, aren't they? The, the ones that are more kind of willing to to um, put themselves out, work the hours, suggest things to other people. You know, the idea yeah. that you're going to sit in front of a computer and somebody's going to come and feed you with work. Yeah. It's just it's just another job for them, isn't it? Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. So if you if you can be more outward going and how can I help you? How can I support you? How can I add value whilst yeah. I'm here on work experience or work placement? That those students tend to generally get more out of it. And it's often the case in the creative industries that the actual jobs, the work that you do, is fairly autonomous anyway. So you kind of have to find what your task is for the day mm-hmm. in, a, in jobs like that. Whereas in, in some of the jobs you'll be, you know, you have a line, might have a line manager who delegates uh, several things to you and you've got responsibility for doing something in a particular area and you're going to work your way through that. If you're working for a, um, a television station as a, a reporter and you're at you know, cub level, you're at entry level, mm-hmm. your job is literally to find news. 
to yeah. go out and see what is happening and then come back with those ideas and say, I've heard that this is, you know, there's a there's been a planning meeting and there's a supermarket that's going to open mm -hmm. and lots of people are, are riled about it. And maybe I could go down and go and talk to those people mm -hmm. and, and we could have a package by the end of the day. So it's very much for self-starters and people that are putting themselves forward and yeah, yeah, interesting. engaging in that kind of process. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Um, so I can illustrate some of that by talking about a bit more about what my career was like. Yeah. And I'm happy for interruptions to, mm -hmm. to happen during this process. So I decided that I wanted to go into journalism uh, before I went to university. And um, at the time, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say how old I am, because, uh, but people should be able to guess by the end of it. Uh, it was in the 1980s when I went to, uh, went to university, went on my degree. And I chose communication studies at the time. Um, there were, I think, five courses in the country in media and communication studies. Uh, there are 500 now. Oh, goodness. Um, so that was interesting in and of itself. It was it was not it was not the kind it was not a degree that was well known or popular. Mm -hmm. um, and I came out of that, and I was just looking. I was I, I decided I was going to stay in the city that I studied for a little while, and um, I was looking for jobs in the media industry, any job in the media industry at that point. And my first job was uh, working on a business to business magazine. Business to business magazines are uh, magazines that are for particular sectors within business. Uh, but I wasn't working on the editorial side. I was selling advertising, which for me was really frustrating. It was one of these, I was in a situation where I was actually in a creative environment doing a non-creative job. Mm -hmm. And we'd have these meetings within the magazine where we'd all be sitting in the room and talking about how what, what was happening within the magazine and um, what the strategy was for the next issue and so on. I was listening to these ideas that people were pitching, wanting to pitch things in myself. And any time that I, any time I, I spoke up or said anything, it would be, why is, why is Carl talking? He's only classifying He's the advertising. Ads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and, you know what, um, Carl? It, it yeah, sounds I, like you, you go by sitting in those meetings – and acting as a, you know, you, you did, you were able to kind of understand more about how a magazine operated in, a business to business magazine operated in practice. So it was valuable experience in that exactly. respect. Yeah, it definitely was because I, I looked, I, I realised then that there were structures within magazine organisations that I didn't know about. No one had taught me these things. Uh, we didn't get taught these things on the degree that I did. Um, what I was able to do with that, knowledge was I, I realized going forward then that there were people that you could get in touch with specifically to pitch to if you wanted to um, work as a freelancer for example mm. which I did later in my career I realized that um, the the way that magazines were financed was not just um, through the cover price that the uh, the price that people pay for the magazine but mostly through advertising. So the department that I worked in was massive. It was bigger than the editorial department. Um, and it was split into two parts as well. There was uh, classified advertising. So that was for jobs and things that um, people want, would place in the magazine. And that was fairly kind of, that was sort of low income source uh, material. And then there was display advertising, which was, for full page ads and and dis, and, and um, graphic ads that organisations and companies would place in the magazine, and I knew how much a page um, in a, in a magazine in a magazine like that cost as well to take out. So I knew just how much of the money was coming from our side of the operation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people that go into uh, magazines mainly from just the journalism side probably don't appreciate that or realise that. Mm -hmm. I realised just how how much of um, any publication in print is paid for mm -hmm. by advertising. And then a few years later, the, the web came along and that's mm -hmm. the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, except there's a bit of a dilemma in web advertising because um, it's difficult to get people to actually click on links and, and pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So while it. while I was while I was doing that, um, the, I did, an opportunity did come up to um, uh, get a job as a trainee reporter. And in the 1980s, it was a different kind of situation for getting into journalism. Now, the, the path tends to be now that you do a, a degree in journalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, either accredited by the National Council for Training in Journalists or the Broadcast Journalism Training Council. And then you can start applying for entry-level jobs and then there's usually some training that's attached. But in the 1970s and 1980s, um, you were trained as to get into newspapers um, at further education level, at tertiary level rather than higher education level. Did, did you did you say you called a cub reporter? Cub. Oh, it's cute, that isn't it? Yeah. So it's like a yeah a cub yeah. reporter because you, you you're still a baby. Yeah. Um. And uh, a newspaper that was in the in the area that um, I grew up in uh, advertised for a trainee reporter, and that would have been an apprenticeship. Um. And if uh, if I'd taken that job up, I would have gone back to college at, at further education level even though I had my degree and learned shorthand and media law and um, ethics and regulation um, alongside doing the job now I actually applied for that and I got it I got that job um, but I didn't take it because at the time I I'd been with a, a girl that I'd met while I was at university. Um, we'd both stayed in the same town after university had finished. And I made the choice to stay with her. And then I think it might have been a couple of months later, we broke up. Oh, what so, a shame, Carl, eh? Yeah. yeah. So that, that was the first block along the way, wasn't it? That's, that's, that's life. These things throw curveballs at us and uh, take us off our journey. Yeah. And it's interesting because there are some some times, you know, you do look back and you wonder what what fork, mm. what the fork in the road might have looked like if you'd gone down it. And I do sometimes wonder what would have happened if I'd I'd taken that opportunity then and I'd, I'd become and gone on to be a newspaper reporter. Mm. Um, I had a funny time after that because um, there was no reason for me to stay in my university town anymore because I'd broken up with that with that that relationship where did you go uh, to uni Carl? i went in coventry i went to coventry do you know i went to coventry uni. oh did you yeah yeah, yeah. Lan- lanchester, lanchester poly yeah yeah that's where i went <laughs> uh, we, we, oh. could, we may have even been <laughs> at a similar time round. maybe yeah um i was in the art faculty um in just doing communication studies mm. and um so i left i left I left coventry I left the magazine because I wasn't I wasn't that um, interested in continuing uh, a career in advertising. I couldn't pitch in the editorial meetings; they wouldn't let me. Um, and I just went home. And um, my mum worked at the co-op, the big department co-op in Huddersfield, where I come from. She got me a job on the loading bay because I had to pay my board. Yeah. And um, so that's what I did, and I did that for six months. And while I was doing that I was applying for master's degrees because I realized that what I wanted to do was start to look into some of the things I'd be started to become interested in in a little bit more detail and one of those um one of those things was computers I'd started to get really interested in computers now it's it might be really difficult for people that are uh, 18 19 to understand but at the end of the 1980s people didn't have personal computers so getting interested in computers was a hobby it was it was very much um, a a decision a choice Um, people might have had game consoles they had uh, there was an you know the nintendo game console was around at that time and there was a one called the atari 2 600 you could play space invaders on it yeah but um using computers yeah, ping pong. Ping pong. Um, what was that Frogger thing? Frogger. That was Frogger. Frogger. Yeah, there's, yeah. There are all those kinds of things. People could play them, mm. but there weren't very many people that had personal computers at home. Um, and I was interested. I became interested in personal computers through making music. Um, I 
bought a computer, an Atari ST computer. I started making music with that computer to control keyboards. And then I found out that I could do things like 3D design with this computer. And I was interested in virtual reality. I was interested in that because I was a science, I like I like science fiction. So all these things started feeding into the interest that I had. Mm -hmm. And I'd kind of forgotten about being a journalist, to be honest. Uh, I just wanted to study that at master's level. And, and I, I had an opportunity to do that. So I did that and I went uh, and did that for about for a year and a half. And I, I came out with a distinction from that. And it was a really valuable time because it that that changed the direction of everything for me for a while. Um, and that consolidated a specialism for me that I didn't have before, because up until that point, I just had a general idea that I might want to be a journalist. I might want to be a writer. But I didn't have anything to write about. I didn't have anything that was a specialism that I could sell to people in that area. Um, it's interesting okay. your master's was in a different sort of area because, uh, again, that's another thing that young people often, they get pigeonholed, don't they? They kind of yeah. I've got to go on this path and it's a straight path and I'm going to do this and then follow on from that. And uh, they don't understand that, that sometimes there are other options that might be better for them and it might mean a change of direction at say at post grad level you know, there's lots of conversion courses and um, yeah. that they could consider i often think as well is one thing i think that some students at, at the age they are find difficult to conceptualize is that um there might be a specialism within their the area that they're interested in that they could narrow their focus down to rather than being a generalist that would give them an advantage and help them get into that industry and, and go through that door. And that's certainly what happened with me. I had, vague, I had this vague idea that I wanted to be um, a journalist of some kind. I don't think I would have been a very good reporter. Um, I, I don't think I would have maintained my interest in it for very long. And even if I had... I think even if I had done that training, I, I think I might have dropped out and been disillusioned mm -hmm. um, because I think you've got to have um, interest, specific interest in certain areas. I think to be a good reporter, you've got to be quite outgoing. You've got to be fairly extrovert. You've got to want to be getting out in the community and talking to people and asking questions. I was always a little bit more reflective and analytical. Um, which is, I think, why I ended up going down the path that I did, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, and then there was a, another couple of um, paths along the way before I actually got to that point where I was happy with the work that I was doing. Uh, I didn't think about going into journalism at that point. That, that idea had gone. Mm -hmm. And when I came out of my master's degree, I was, I was thinking I'm, what I probably could, should do with this cutting edge information that I have is teach at university level, because from my perspective, from what I could, from my understanding at the time, that's what you did. You know, if you, if you're doing research, you continue doing research. Yeah. So I was looking for opportunities to continue doing that research. There was no way I was going to be able to afford to do a PhD at the time with my background. Um, my, my mum was, um, uh, a cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a, a, a technician in a school. I was the first person that went to university. Yeah. So there, was, there wasn't a, really an option for me to just then apply for a PhD and fund that myself. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So I was looking for um, opportunities really to continue doing research. And that's why I looked for lecturing jobs and I managed to find one. I was only looking for part-time jobs but I landed a full-time job as a lecturer, a university lecturer, mm -hmm. at 23, wow. coming, out, coming out of my master's degree. And the reason for that, the reason why I think they took me on is because this was a time when people were starting to use computers in universities for the first time. Mm -hmm. And again, this is something that young people will find difficult to conceptualise. When I did my degree all the essays that I wrote were in longhand. Mm -hmm. and I, I remember it well, Carl. Yeah. I've, I've still got them. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. 
in, indeed, when I got the job, I would write my lectures out in, in longhand and we would have overhead film, yeah, overhead projectors. Yeah. If you wanted to show a diagram to students, you had to get it printed out onto a, onto a piece of acetate and put it onto an overhead projector, yeah. not a PowerPoint like this. Yeah. Um, and so the, the skills I had were rare. That was the issue, really. And, and um, I think that's why I was able to get that full time job, because there just weren't that many people around with mm. IT skills and media skills. But it, 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 you were making the point, don't you, that, you know, students can differentiate themselves by having those skills that employers are looking for. And yeah. it, it, for example, at the moment, one of the things is saying to students, use the time to learn digital skills. You know, l simple things like advanced Excel skills yes. are, are always sought after by employers. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you can if you can make yourself stand out in some way, that yeah. is uh, you'd be in an advantageous position. Yeah. Well, a lot of our our students now d differentiate themselves through their digital capabilities as well, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a similar kind of transition that's occurring in in journalism now. Um, we're moving more away from print into online, and there are a lot of people that don't like that that's happening. But it we can't. You can't say it's not happening. It is happening. Um, and so young people often have some advantage in that because they're used to using um, app, mobile applications and social media. Um, and one of the things that our course, for example, does for students is um, it concentrates in some parts on digital media production and the way that you can you can create that kind of content using a best practice method. And funny that this actually leads me to what the next bit really, because while I was doing that teaching back in the nineties, mm -hmm. um, I was able to develop a, a module in digital media production, and, and I could see at the time that it was some it was a skill that would be starting to become valuable. Um, I managed to make an argument that that would be the case, and. I was allowed to do it, I was, and but it was it was strange because there was a lot of resistance. There's a lot of people think thought that it was kind of a trivial thing that it was a it was playing because the kind of um, thing that the students did on that module was they created websites. So this is 1992, 93. The web literally launched in 1992, and I don't think people saw the value of it at the time. No one was using it. The students were, but oh, uh, you know people that were in my department didn't know what it was. Um, they were also creating multimedia content, which is effectively the kind of uh, the analog for the social media content that students are creating now. Mm -hmm. And um, I had students creating content for virtual reality as well on that module. Oh. Because that was a big thing, funnily enough, at the end of the 80s, and then it went away and it came back again. So that that was strange. I, I remember my younger brother having a, a game, like a Sharks game, and you look, you looked at it, it you put it up to your eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that yeah. must have been the early, early, you know, stages of it. Yeah, it's really interesting that it went, it, it got very big and everyone was very excited about it. And I just don't think the, the technology was quite there. Mm. And it, then it went away so, so thoroughly that mm. everyone forgot about it. And now it's, now it's coming back again. Yep. So that was interesting. I was able to do that and and that was it was valuable for me, but also at the same time that the culture was very difficult in that I just couldn't get anybody to take the idea of this digital media revolution that we now know took place mm. seriously. No one was particularly interested in it at the time. I couldn't get I couldn't get um funding for research. I applied. The whole reason I went into teaching was to try and get a PhD and I got I had that promised to me in my interview and then turned down for the funding for the research when I applied for it um so I didn't want to stay there <laughs> anymore either mm. because the reason that I'd, that I actually taken the job had been taken away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and I was getting something out of it because I was having the I did have the opportunity to develop modules but um, it wasn't enough it wasn't enough for me to continue developing. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I was I was doing that job for a, quite a few years. I was um, I think between twenty three and twenty six, 
I was I was working on that full time. Um, and then I I saw an advert. And this again, this was completely happenstance, and it just shows the chaotic way these things can happen. I was not thinking about journalism. Mm. The last time I thought about it in any detail was back in my when I was 20 or 21. Um, but what I did do is I used to look at the media ads in The Guardian on a Thursday every week. And uh, one week this uh, this advert popped up and I saw it and, I'm, and I thought, well, I'm going to apply for that. It was a new magazine that was launching called Computer Arts. Mm-hmm. Um, they were looking for freelancers that were had design in their background that were familiar with digital media production and that could write. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I ticked those boxes, so I emailed the editor at the time. He told me what he wanted was uh, they wanted a regular um, long-form article where uh, an artist was interviewed. And I would have to try and find that artist, and it had to be someone that was working with digital media. Mm-hmm. And because I'd been developing modules and in that community, I knew quite a few people from my master's degree and from um, my lecturing who fitted that bill. And I said so. I said I, I can I can interview this person and this person and this person, and and we'll do that. And I started cr- writing these. And again, this is in this might be interesting for um, people that are living in digital times now. The first articles I submitted for that computer arts magazine, which was very ahead of its time, very cutting edge, I sent them by post on floppy disks. So I. Mm-hmm. Produced the articles yeah. in a digital form, but I didn't email them because the bandwidth wasn't good enough to send all the images over. You had to put them on a disc and send them by, by post. That was the only way you could do it. In the dial-up days, Carl. You yeah. dial up, didn't you? And yeah. yeah so did, you exactly. have, did, did you have to freelance or did you have to kind of do some work for nothing initially no, to get I, that job? I went straight into freelancing and uh, was paid right from the beginning right. of that. I don't. I never wrote for free. I never have written for free. And I, I would um, say to students, if you can avoid doing it, if you can avoid writing for free, you should. You should see your value and the value in your work as much as possible. And even if you're only being paid 25 quid for 200 words of a blog, mm. you know, at least that you, you're seeing that that's you're putting value on what you do that way. Now, having said that you do have to build build a portfolio. But I think that you've got to have a cutoff point Mm -hmm. at some point along the way and say, I'm not going to do this for free anymore. Mm. Um, Because if you can't continue to do things for free, two things will happen. Um, Firstly, you'll start to see the value of your work as free and what you do as, as having no intrinsic value. And secondly, other people will think the same thing. So it, it's, I think it's really important to see that what you do um, as a creative content producer, as work, and a work that has an exchange value, um, and to fight as, um, as hard as you can to make sure that you um, always get the value back for the work that you do. Mm-hmm. Or I guess at least to kind of negotiate that if I can do this for you for three months and you're happy with what I'm producing, then I will be looking to some paid work. Yes. And, you know, make some sort of deal with the the agency yeah. or the yeah that you're dealing with. Absolutely, and I would say that's that's great in theory, but also I think when once you start working for people for free, yeah, even if you have those agreements in place. Um, it's very rare that you can change that agreement later on. Right. Because you start going down a track where the value of your work is nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you say later on, I want you, you know, I'm going to want you to pay me 10 pence a word, then they'll find someone else who can do the, what you were doing for nothing. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Tricky I think, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's quite, it's imperative, really, for pr- professional writers and journalists to dig their heels in as much as possible yeah. 
mm-hmm. and ascribe value to the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, you know, also make it very clear to to uh, publications that are setting up that are, that are publishing content that they should be paying as well. Yeah. Um, if, they, if they're using it, if they're publishing it, then they're gaining something out of it, aren't they? So Absolutely. Yeah, they're getting a return from it. Um, I've, I've annoyed people in the past um, because they've come to me and they've asked if we can provide students the, to create content for their organisations and their startups. And I look at these very carefully. And if a startup is uh, genuinely, uh, say, a website with, that's run by enthusiasts, who are really interested in a specific niche area. So if it's, you know, a group of people that want to start a football website or people that want to create local news for a local area because it's not there or they're interested in music or fashion, um, I'll pass that opportunity on to students and say, you know, this might be something to build your portfolio up. Mm. Um, But we also encounter quite a lot. We'll get um, PR agencies or digital agencies in the area Mm. who have put up a website and the purpose of that website is to to create free advertising for their clients, and then they'll try and find, excuse me, <clears throat> they'll try to find students mm. to produce that content for free. So what those students are doing is they're creating content that's got a monetary value mm-hmm. to a PR agency and a digital agency and the clients that are paying them good money mm. to do that um, for nothing. Yeah. And that is, for me, that's, it's not ethical and it's not right. Mm. And they should be paying something to those students. Mm. And I don't pass those opportunities on if I, if I investigate them. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, So the, what happened then is because I was starting to get regular work out of that. And uh, I also started doing other things other than the profiles I realized I could make money out of it. Um, and it occurred to me, this could be this could be my job. I could do this for a living if I've got enough people who are willing to, uh, you know, who I can talk to and who will commission this work. Mm-hmm. So I identified other magazines. And the first one was one called .NET Magazine, which at the time was, it was very much like Wired Magazine in those days. It's more of a, it's, it's only just, interestingly enough, folded. Oh. Uh, in the in this year during the coronavirus crisis, oh. um, but later on it was it was aimed at web designers. It was a little bit more kind of niche. But when it started, it was more of a general magazine about internet culture, and I had some I had a great time working on that for a long time. Um, <clears throat> but I had to really fight hard to get into that magazine. Um, I read it. It was a magazine I read. And I enjoyed the material that was in it very much. Um, and I sent an email to the editor with a couple of ideas for articles and he just didn't get back to me. And I followed up on that and he didn't get back to me. And I came up with a couple of other ideas and I sent them to the editor again and I didn't hear anything from him. <clears throat> and in the end, I spoke to the editor that I'd been working with because they were in the same organisation, in the same publisher. And I said, do you know this guy? Is he is he all right? Because I've been sending ideas to him. I've just not heard back from him. He said, yeah, he's okay. Why don't you give him a ring? And so I did. And I must have caught him at a really busy time because he was really annoyed that I'd called him when I started pitching to him. And he said, and he, then he said, send me an email. And I said, I've sent you three emails and I haven't had a reply from you. Mm. <laughs> um he said, oh, if you send me an email now, I'll get back to you. So I think the fact that I'd, I'd shown that willingness and also I'd been a bit tenacious meant that the next email I sent, he actually noticed. Mm. He saw my name and he read it this time. Yeah. And that was the first commission I got out of .NET magazine. Mm. It was a big article as well. I remember um, it running over eight pages. So that was a, quite a gamble for him to take mm-hmm. to someone that he, he'd not used as a, as a freelancer before to give over eight, eight pages of his magazine. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I worked for Dot Net magazine for years after that because of that conversation. And within, I, I just used the same technique really for a bunch of other magazines. I made a list of magazines I wanted to work for. I got in touch with the editors. I pitched ideas to them. Um, and three years later, so this is year 2000, there, thereabouts, um, I was 30 by that time. And I, I had left my job as a lecturer. I was making probably twice as much as I had been at the time as a lecturer because I was a lecturer grade, not, not senior lecturer or principal, which is a bit more. Um, just out of freelancing, really, and running my own business as a, as a journalist, as a magazine journalist. And I had, because I built up relationships with those magazines, um, the trips would come up and they'd get in touch with me and I would be able to go and <clears throat> I'll be able to go on those trips and travel the world. So I was able to go to um, San Francisco, to see the launch of um, Microsoft products and I was able to go to the Netherlands. Um, and I, my work was in magazines as well, just around the world. And one of the interesting things that happened very quickly is that work would be translated and, um, I'd, I'd, you know, it would be published in American magazines and um, Japanese magazines and Russian magazines. Really interesting. Yeah. Isn't it interesting what you're saying about how hard you had to try, though, to get through to that first guy at .NET Magazine to get him to give you a break? And, you know, we often say, young people today, that it's the tenacity that you need to just keep on trying. And, and if you fail, in inverted commas, it, it's a learning experience. Yeah. Um, and you just got to keep on going. And eventually, some, some good will come. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's be, so it's about being t tenacious and identifying those opportunities. And when those opportunities come, in, come up, you go in front of them as well, being, yep. um, making sure that you, you take advantage of what's there. Sounds like you had a fabulous period of time, though, traveling the world and uh, running yeah. your own business. And did you commission other writers at that stage then, Carl? I, I, never, I, I, I did work as um, an editor on a couple of projects, on special projects. But it was that wasn't my specialism really. I'm I was I was a more of a features writer, and that's what I tried to stick to as much as possible. Okay. I did a lot of other kinds of work. I did reviews and tutorials, and and that was the bread and butter in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But the interesting stuff was features writing. Was was doing investigations into into things, and it was all around tech. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think during that time, I kind of built up a, a reputation as well of being a, a reliable fe features writer so that's another thing that that helped propel that that career along i guess that's really important any freelance work isn't it that you've, it is. you've, got, to, you've got to be reliable and do what you promise and yep. deliver by the deadlines etc yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah is this manchester carl i can see here it is yeah so i went to i went back to university um in I'm trying to try to think when it was been. I think it was 2009 or 2010, and at the time I was looking for a new challenge. Um, so I went to the University of Manchester and did another master's degree. Um, and part of it was because um, freelancing is great, and I had a terrific time, and I was really enjoying myself and the work that I did. Uh, but there's not wasn't much progression. So once you've hit a level. You stay at that level, and I was starting to think, I'm, I'm in my forties now, and I was trying to think, starting to think about what I was going to do into, for retirement, and um, I was looking at my career in a different way, and in a way that I wouldn't have done in my twenties. So I was, I was starting to think about what I was going to do next, and I was just carrying on doing the freelancing, and I got another master's degree. Um, and then uh, I wasn't immediate. I didn't immediately get a post as course director at Leeds Beckett University. But um, a few years ago, nine years ago, mm -hmm. I started teaching at Leeds Beckett on a part time basis at first. Mm -hmm. And that just supplemented my my freelance income. Um, and 
over a, a period of time, I think I, I just made decisions as I was going along that um, I wanted security rather than excitement mm-hmm. <laughs> at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. And I was starting to enjoy as well um, working with students more and more. Um, and and so as those opportunities start to come up, again, that's that was it. I was making those decisions based on the opportunities that came up, the opportunities that arrived. Um, and ended up where I am now, which is um, teaching the next generation of mm. journalists mm. how to do what I did, really. Amazing. Yeah, we used to talk about portfolio careers, didn't we? You know, like yeah. you said, part-time freelance writing and part-time lecturing. And we don't yeah. use that word so much now, but it's yeah. kind of commonplace, isn't it, for people to have it different is income streams. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, that, I was, uh, for a while, when I, fir- when I first started at Leeds Beckett, that's what I was doing. I was doing both. I was I was continuing as a journalist, um, and I was teaching part time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, as the opportunities to to move up the ladder as a as a lecturer mm-hmm. presented themselves, I realised that I would have to concentrate on one thing or the other and make a choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. I ended up making the choice to work full time at Leeds Beckett. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Mm. So a question for you, Carl. What yeah. tips have you got for, you, you know, you, you're preparing the next generation? What what sort of advice or what you what have you learned? Oh, there you go. What have you learned along go. the way? Yeah. yeah here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think some of the takeaways really are that um, I worry some I worry sometimes that um, students might think that the degree is the is the door that opens and then you walk through the door and there's a big shining gold light coming through that door. And you walk into the rest of your life and you're living your life already. This is already your life. Um, and I don't think it is a gold, golden ticket. It's not that that shining portal, a degree, but it's a start. And it and it's um, a collection of experiences that you've had and specialisms and a period of growing up. Um, and it, it could be the thing that takes you on to the next step. And then the next step will be another learning experience in itself and you'll meet other people and there'll be other opportunities. So I think it's um, important to recognise that it's a stop on the way. Okay. Um, yeah, and so not, ta- get, so. not get disheartened yeah. that things don't fall into place immediately. I think that's one of the real takeaways is don't ever feel like you're failing because things are not happening exactly as you thought they were going to do um, way back when you started your degree. Because there's no, as, as it says there, there's no single right way of doing things. There might be, you might end up getting there a different way around. So it's about recognising that there'll be opportunities and experiences and, and making the most of the things that, that happen. And you used the word earlier on about happenstance sometimes. Yeah you don't plan them, you know, you, you know, it, it wasn't part of the, the scheme and the career journey, but actually just thinking this could be valuable. I'll, I'll, uh, we will take, seize this opportunity. And I, I, I find that, you know, sometimes students, as you say, I think the degree is the golden ticket and it's often mm-hmm. saying to them, look, you know, you have to have other things besides your degree now, um, the extracurricular activities. Um, so that you can showcase and demonstrate what you can offer an employer. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But taking opportunities and seizing opportunities as they come along is really, really important, I think, isn't it, as they arise? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that what, what we ended up with was, and, and we, I think we started talking about this here because I posted something about this on Twitter. Yeah. And this was the takeaway. This is the real takeaway, I think, at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, the un- the only thing that you can be certain of is uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I know that um, when I'm work when I work with students, a lot a lot of the time students will ask me for certainty about specific things. Mm-hmm. And there's there's, there's something that you can give certainty about. You can say when a piece of work needs to be in, and what will happen if you don't hand that piece of work in on time. Um, but as we have learned, the hard way of the last three months the only constant is change mm-hmm. um, we've had to adapt to very specific and unusual and extraordinary circumstances and new ways of doing things mm-hmm. 
that's just an exaggerated, it's just an exaggerated version of what is always happening. Um, your life will always change. Good things will happen and you will be able to take opportunities and seize them. And sometimes things will come along that will challenge you as well. And for example, you know, the, the opportunity I had to um, train as a, a reporter back in my 20s, I didn't, I didn't take that. And then a couple of months later, my life was turned upside down by the breakdown of a relationship. And mm -hmm. I um, ended up going down another path. And that path ended up here eventually mm -hmm. after going mm -hmm. different ways. But yeah. that was because life is change. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like it took you in a direction that was better for you in the long run. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it, I could say, in hindsight, yes, looking back, I think it probably was because it gave me that opportunity to work as a features journalist, as a magazine journalist. I'm not sh I, I might have got there anyway, uh, but as I said earlier on, I don't think I was a reporter. And um, yeah. I was interested in journalism, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I think it might have, he could have even put me off journalism for life, being a reporter, because I know what reporters are like now. I work with a lot of reporters and I, talk to them and I know what kind of job they do um, and I know that it wasn't particularly the kind of journalism I, I was interested in and maybe it, it took that for me to find out what what I needed to do and what I wanted to do um, and I, I think young people are probably offering in, in that position as well where they, they might have a vague idea about what they're interested in and what they want to do you don't really know until you're in it and yeah. you're doing it um, on that, yeah. Yeah, well, that's when you find out. Yeah, sure. Carl, I'm conscious of time. Cause, yes. Uh, yeah. So um, I was going to ask you about networking, but I don't think we've got time to do that. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much for sharing your journey today. It's been fascinating. And some, some brilliant takeaways for, for young people and our students that are embarking on their career journeys that, I go, going back to the beginning you know it's not always a linear straight path it's a windy yeah. wiggly road and that doesn't make it any less valuable uh, than than a linear journey so thanks very much